This corridor today um, sort of stands on the back of what we began in May this year with the four weeks we had across the hall at the Peace Hall. Then uh, on the night of a crazy storm, we had um, Dr. Alistair Reese come and talk about Pākehā identity, which was a really, really wonderful night. And so uh, Matua David here is really the, probably the, for us gathering on this larger crew the last of the year to have um, uh, Matua David come in and, and present in this for, for me. So uh, Matua Rāwari, no more, uh, get too quick. Uh, please come and uh, speak to us today. So Kia ora. thank you, sir. Yeah, no, Over to you. <coughs> Te mea tuatahi uh, ki a whakakururi a tia ki te atua, i runga rawa ki a mau te rongo ki runga ki te whenua, ki a pai te whakaaro ki ngā tangata katoa. Te mea tuarua ki ngā mate o tēnā hāhi o tēnā marae, uh, o te whare o Windsor, um, ke te tau to, 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 toko a hau uh, ngā kōrero e te rangatira mō kuini i e, e rihapiti te tuarua. Uh, e te kuini haere, haere, haere ki ngā ringa ringa o te hepara pai. Moe mai, moe mai, moe mai. E te kuini. <coughs> te mea tua toru. Ki te maunga e tū, e tū, e tū. Te maunga tei tei, te maunga tapu tapu, ko taranaki. E tū, e tū, e tū. Kei te maumahara a hau ngā porupiti <coughs> tūturu. Uh, o ngā rā o mua, ko te fiti rawa ko tohu, o te atiawa ki parihaka, tēnā kōrua, tēnā kōrua, tēnā kōrua. Moi tonu, moi tonu, moi tonu e rotu te rangi mārie o te ariki te hepara pai. <coughs> te rangatira ko jei tēnā koe, mō ngā kupureka ki a hau, tēnā koe e hoa, uh, kei te hari te ngākau, um, te hainenga mai e tēnā atu a tāhua, tēnā koe, tēnā koe. E te whānau a te kraiti ko hui mai nei i tēnei, i tēnei ata, tēnā koutou. Ki ngā mana whenua o Paranenehi ki Waitotara, mati atu o koutou e manaki. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Lovely to be with you this morning. I, uh, it's a topic I love. I um, feel very much at home here. I started coming here in 1990, I think, and came about once or twice a year for 25 years. I love the place and love what is happening to it now, which I'm going to get onto in a minute. Uh, such a beautiful um, unfolding of gospel witness in the light of our topic today. I'm talking about the church's role in decolonization and to assist us, I've got a bit of a resource for you here. Um, so if we can just give these out, if there's too many people, go one between two because you'll, you'll know how to share. But it should be 55 copies. See how you go. So if you doze off, people doze off listening to bishops. It's, um, I don't know why. But uh, you can take this home and read what I was saying later, if you like. All right, so thank you. That's where I should be, actually. I should be here to work this machine. That is great. We can move that just closer to you, but... That's all right. No, no, not too bad. Okay. Thank you. Go one between two if you uh, can't see one. It's not life and death, but just be handy. I'll grab one, so thank you so much. We'll dip into this occasionally over the next 45 minutes. We're not going to read it now, but it'll be handy every now and then as we go along. We're not going through all of it, but we're going to just cherry-pick uh, some things as we go along. Well, you can see here on the screen some of the images that we need to, to address. Uh, there's the, the whenua, uh, a maunga tapu o Aotearoa, ko taranaki, uh, here, uh, the ancient God-given land that emerged out of the sea millennia and millennia ago, and the arrival of people from Hawaii a thousand years ago who welcomed the first gospel bearer in 1814 from Paramatta in Sydney. And then the arrival of many other people from Europe and 
then the production of God-inspired prophets to proclaim the seed of the gospel in local ways for justice and for righteousness. So there's just a quick bit of an overview of where we're going to go uh, this morning. And central to it, and in your document, is to Tititi or Waitangi, what a covenant said about the way we should get along. We paid tribute, Jay and I, to Queen Elizabeth this morning. And one of the reasons for that is that her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, agreed to a sacred covenant between the Māori chiefs at Waitangi and many others around the Motu and her own people. And she pledged that for her side of the bargain, she would uphold the promises made there. So one of the crucial things we remember at the passing of Queen Elizabeth II is that her great-great-grandmother is one of the reasons we're called to partnership together in these islands. And she's a living icon, and her son has become a living icon of that treaty himself. So that's just a quick, a quick intro to where we're going. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to start where, where Jesus started. I, I love the way uh, Jay began this morning. Um, we're talking about a, a Jesus movement. We're talking about a Messiah. We're talking about a son of God who arose up within the house of Israel. And one of the greatest ways in which he shared his message, the message of God's kingdom, was the parable of the sower. I'm going to say a little prayer uh, before we get into this, because we're dealing with sacred things, and I'll say it in both the languages of the treaty, in Oitatu. E te o tua kaharoa te kaihanga o ngā mea katoa, manākitia tēnei huhunga, manākitia ngā kupu, ngā moimoia, manākitia ngā ākonga, ngā tauira pea, ko tai mai nei, mo tēnei huhunga, manākitia mato ko tai mai nei, i roto i tō aroha. We leave ourselves wide open to your wisdom, O God, your love, your peace and the hope you have placed within us this morning. Amen. So, <clears throat> first of all, when an Aramaic rabbi in the Middle East, in Israel-Palestine, talks about sowing seeds, as you know from the famous parable in Luke 8, he's talking about something that is so generous, like so um, hospitable, uh, the seed can go almost anywhere. He uses his hand to share a kingdom message that kind of goes like this rather than like that. In other words, it can land almost anywhere and, let's face it, in any human heart. Not someone singled out for special treatment. It goes, he's aiming for lots of good soil, but some of it, hands on the rocks, some of it's taken by birds, some of it's scorched, some of it has thorns that choke it. And he doesn't mind saying that because you never know. You never know how it might seed. And it's not for us to judge where the good soil is only because he didn't. He didn't. He said we shouldn't judge. Uh, he just shares it as widely as he can in the most unlikely places. And we know from his own story in the New Testament, he could sow a seed by scattering widely, even amongst people sleeping under hedges, even in someone who was a sex worker for transformation, even in a publican, even in a Roman centurion who was oppressing his own people and his daughter even in somebody who'd been excluded by Hansen's disease or leprosy. He didn't say, I'm, I'm going to try and work out whether you're going to be good soil or not. He just went like that. And the Maori phrase, uh, te rui, rui ruia, picks that up very well in Maori. It's a, it's a generous, uh, very active kind of word. <clears throat> te rui ka kanu ngā pura pura pai, the sharing of good seed. And one of the insights we've got from Aramaic biblical scholars now, particularly Kenneth Bailey, 
you can Google on him and watch his videos, he's found out that this Aramaic Jesus way of sharing ngā purapura pai, te ruruia o ngā kākono, is that what is being sown and by whom? And he's found out that in the Aramaic world, Jesus' own world, his own reo, his own language, his own iwi, his own people, his own whenua, they thought that the sower in Jesus' parable was God the creator that Jay referred to at the beginning. We sometimes think it's Jesus himself only, which he was doing in his message. But when Jesus told the story, he was talking about his father. He wasn't saying, I am sowing the seed. He was saying, the kingdom of God is like a sower who went out to sow. And that's God, that's his father. That's God the creator. And the seed that's being sown are the seeds of the kingdom of God embodied in the one whom the Father sent. So Jesus is the one who's being sown in a way in the hearts of the people. He's talking about his mission and himself from God the Father. And that's a slightly different angle, perhaps, than we might otherwise have. And what that means is that you will find the Creator and his generosity, his pura pura pai, everywhere. And to look for signs of that seed, to look for signs of that coming, to look for signs of that kingdom uh, is what we're, we're on about, and it can happen anywhere. That's the powerful thing. The other thing they found, and this lovely word, te rui kākano ngā pura pura pai, is that when Jesus speaks his own language, it's very, very close to Māori grammar. They've done a lot of work on the way Jesus speaks, and they've worked out how he would have said this parable in his own language. Go back from the Greek, reconstruct the words in his own language, Aramaic. And you find that it's very similar to Māori grammar, which is a verb oriented language. It's poetry in motion. It doesn't get too many clunky nouns bottling up a sentence. It just goes with a flow of meaning and energy and verb orientation, if you like. There's no verb to be in the present tense because, like if you say in Māori, um, kei to parakuhi a hau, the best way of understanding that is, I am breakfasting. <laughs> or, say for example, um, if I was to stand on this chair, I would be turning that chair into a ladder. So I would say that even though it's a chair, call it a chair, when I stand on top of it, I'm laddering. It's a verb oriented movement of action. And what you've got here in this powerful dynamic of seeds scattering everywhere is the Aramaic way of understanding the movement of God's love. God is a verb as well as a noun. And it's a beautiful way of seeing. And one of the reasons that the gospel spreads so quickly in Aotearoa, just Te Rongo Aruka, the first full gospel, which is this quote here, was precisely because it felt familiar in its message and medium. Like horticulture, uh, taro, planting taro, planting kumara, the process of planting itself uh, felt very uh, recognisable. And the idea of going out and doing that as a subsistence farmer was precisely the Māori environment. Now, there are hundreds of other examples from Luke that did this. We're going to look at two more in a minute. But one of the reasons that this happened from an Aramaic speaking, thinking Jesus to a Māori thinking, speaking people from 1840 and onwards is this profoundly intimate relationship and recognition of language, tribal experience, horticulture, agriculture, and we'll see in a minute, whanaungatanga and hohoi te rongo. So reconciliation and family. So at this particular moment, when the gospel arrived in the form of te rongo paiaruka, this was not in any way misrepresented by colonization. It was Luke to ngā āriki, ngā rangatira, ngā whāia, ngā whānau. Jesus 
to and with and in the Māori world, directly in the Māori language. There was a lovely moment when somebody did an analysis uh, two years ago of the amount of Māori evangelism using Luke's gospel in a bi Māori, for Māori, Māori only environment. And she found that 80% of the seed sowing of the gospel, of Te Rongo Paiaruka, Luke's gospel, was in a bi Māori, for Māori, with Māori venue. And the Pākehā contribution had been the printing press, had been the book itself, and had been the initial literacy. But 80% of it happened like a ripple in a pond, like seeds going out widely into the fields, way beyond the initial European mission. And most of it was a by Māori, for Māori, with Māori moment of recognition and communion and deepening understanding. So at this particular point, the gospel was not changed much by colonization at all. It was just what it was, it, the gospel itself. <clears throat> now let's look at one example in particular. Te Hākari Nunui, the parable of the great feast in Luke 14. And this is an example of what I've been trying to say. The Messiah, like a, the man who gives a big feast in Luke, wants to throw a large hakari, a meal, with his hangi pit, so to speak, his feeding capacity from his home in a little village on the edge of the desert. And he decides that out of his hospitality, seed sowing generously everywhere, anywhere, doesn't matter, he will start letting people know that he wants to spread a table for them. And this is Aramaic village culture, which is so close to, to the Māori world. A huge hākari, and let everybody know, why don't you all come? It's my honour to share with you. And in that culture, there's no phones, there's no newspapers, there's no television, there's no computers. Uh, so you ask someone to go out into the village two or three weeks before to say to people, I'd like to put on a big hangi, I'd like you to come, I need a rough idea of some of the numbers because I don't want to be embarrassed by too little food in a subsistence village, and I don't want to be embarrassed by too much because that's wasteful. I want a rough idea of who's coming. So the servant of this table goes out to Ngā Rangatira, initially, the, the good and the great of the village. And they um, must have given some indication. That, all right, yeah, okay, fair enough, I'll, 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 I'd love to come, or I'm, I'm coming. They certainly didn't say no. So the servant goes back, and he goes back to the host, the Messiah, this is Jesus and his mission, and says, well, roughly speaking, we've got three big groups. So they get the right fatted calf, they get the right number of food and so on, to roughly equate with what they can expect. You don't want to overestimate or underestimate. And that's quite important, it takes a couple of weeks to get all this ready. Then, when the hangi is lifted, that is to say when the food is hot and ready, there's no phones, no newspapers, no clocks, he sends the servant out again and says, the day's come, as you know, the food is ready to be served. Uh, we're looking forward to welcoming you. And the servant gets three excuses. You know what they are. The first one is, I've bought a field and I must look at it really closely. <laughs> now think about that. Um, you would normally look at it really closely and then buy it. Why would you inspect it close to the ground if you'd, you know, why would you do that? He's lying. <laughs> Secondly, another household, presumably a big household, who'd bring lots of people, maybe, um, says, well, I've bought a team of oxen and I've got to try them out to see if they work as a team. <laughs> it's like buying six Mazdas and seeing if the ignition works after you've bought them. <laughs> it's a lie. But the worst one is the last one. 
I've got married and I'm not allowed out of the house. <laughs> uh, so. And the, ki the, Kiwis, the Kiwis have a special word for this. It's an orchestrated litany of lies. <laughs> just, uh, just saying. So the servant goes back to the host and says, they're not coming. They don't get what you're trying to do here. And, of course, they're not coming because they're not quite sure who else will be there. Like, they know this guy has been working with publicans and sinners and prostitutes and people who sleep under hedges and people with disabilities and so on. I'm not going to humiliate myself or my mana in front of all these other sinners because they know what the host has been doing with his love feasts, with his mission, with his sermons, his healing, his prophecy. They know what he's like. So they just humiliate him. All this food and no one's coming. So Pharisaic contempt for the kingdom of God as it's coming in through Jesus of Nazareth. So the servant is sent out by the host to bring in, and the old-fashioned words are, the halt, the lame, and the blind. Halt meaning people with disabilities, differently abled, we would say today. Lame, can't walk. Blind can't see. And commentators for generations now have said this profoundly moving point. The blind can't inspect a field. The lame can't drive oxen. And people in that culture, in that age, with disabilities, never married. So as the sin multiplied, so grace abounded all the more to include and gather in from all kinds of soil and all kinds of gardens and all kinds of places, everybody who weren't, and they weren't expecting this. Most of them weren't expecting it. Oh my goodness, wasn't expecting this. But you are welcome here. We want you to come. And he actually says, compel them, surprise them, encourage them, bring them. And then this is the busiest person in the New Testament. I feel sorry for this servant. He got sent out another time, <laughs> to the fourth time, to people who sleep under hedges and people who are traveling through, which means they're not necessarily Jewish. It's a Gentile traveler, maybe, certainly someone without a home who sleeps under the hedge. Normally the local Jewish community would have a whareo home to stay in. The poorest of the poor, certainly. And he brings them in to this extraordinary messianic banquet. And when you say this in a Māori context, on a marae or a whare kai or a hāngi, there's a moment of immediate recognition about ngā manuhiri katoa. The people who may be suffering from poverty or other mamai or illnesses, uh, your aroha, your heart responds, and you think he's telling the truth, he's offering the truth in some transformative way, which we recognize and can work with and want to mobilize around, and you get a Maori mission. And this happened independently of the colonizing process, by and large. I won't go into this one, but you recognize it immediately. What do you do with someone who's been abused, badly beaten, neglected, left on the side of the road to die? Your heart goes out to them, and Jesus of Nazareth says, even though they're a different race, even though they're a different belief, and they were different, Samaritans were different from Jews, reach out across the divide, because it's team human here. The, the word in the parable of the Good Samaritan, Tengako Nunui, the big-hearted one, Luke 10 is, it says there in Greek, and they went back to the Aramaic word, like his tummy turned over, it's the same root word as a woman giving birth. It's like the in profound internal movement of someone producing something new in themselves and in their situation. It's a beautiful word, splenthekthani in Greek. It comes out of this nako nunui, 
this kind of hugely sensitive, open, responsive heart to a stranger who is not your iwi, is not your belief, is not your condition, and you're putting yourself at risk to save him. Uh, I won't go through the rest of the parable there, but that again made sense in the mind of Tarapipipi to Waharoa Urimu Taihana at Waharoa. He looked at this in his marae, having got the gospel from Charlotte Brown, wonderful CMS catechist, amazing woman, and then she had to go. She left after a year, but he taught himself to read from her little book of Luke. He helped his great niece, Tarore, to read it. And when he saw this, he said to himself, I've got to go to Te Aroa and make peace with them. So he invited them to a great feast and reconciled with his long-standing enemies who had been part of the uh, incident that resulted in Tarore's death. This is what got him mobilized and motivated and changed the face of certainly Ngāti Hauwa and Te Aroa relationships. It's the only thing that ended the war. Tarore and this message from Te Rongo Paiaruka, the only gospel they had. So, <clears throat> in Aotearoa, we have this beautiful God-given creation which has been here from millennia since it came up out of the sea. It's got an ancient little dinosaur there. We've got a parson bird, a tui. I'm 104. We give thanks for these things as gifts from God. And again, looking at Psalm 104, looking at Waiata 104, in that early mission period, there was a great deal of thanksgiving to Te Atua Kaharawa, Te Kaihanga, Onga Meakato, which they already sensed and had venerated for generations. Beautiful. Um, they had a, a saying in Kahununu, Kotahi tonu tu wairua onga meakatoa, meaning there is one spirit, creator spirit in all creation. And Psalm 104 just lit up that pepeha, that whakatauaki. And there was recognition, there was response, and again, largely independent of the colonizing process. And what we have, we put in today's terms with these things, to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, parable of the sower, to teach, baptize, and nurture believers, the Māori missions, to respond to human need by loving service, the Good Samaritan, to seek to transform unjust structures, the Great Feast, to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth, Psalm 104. Many examples of this holistic mission <coughs> took off. Took off. Well, um, let's, before we get on to this next bit, let's just jump into here and have a look. The Treaty of Waitangi. This was also an attempt to express something from the Bible in a way that would shape the country and birth a new understanding between the European arrivals and the Māori community. And what essentially happened there was Two, two words, which I'll use here, just to... These are from Luke. The same gospel we've been looking at. Te Kawanatapu, the heart of the matter. A Bible-based, faith-based relationship between Māori mission-educated chiefs who are familiar with Luke's gospel and the Anglican missionary, Henry Williams, and some of the Anglican... Church of England people who'd come from Britain. And what they did was they said, we trust Luke's gospel. We've been mobilized by it. We recognize it. We embrace it. How can we get along using the same gospel? And in Luke, there are two big words that shape them. One is kawanatanga, and the other is rangatiratanga. That's Waitangi there, by the way, the Farinui at Waitangi. Where they, where they agreed to this. Now, rangatiratanga is the Māori word for chieftainship or kingdom. And you have in Luke, te rangatiratanga o te atua o te rangatiratanga o te rangi, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. It's chiefly rule. God's chiefly rule. The other word was 
Kawanatanga. And that came from Kawana, the governor of Judea, who happened to be Pontius Pilate. And what you've got in Luke is two particular dimensions. There's the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and the responsibilities of government between Pontius Pilate and King Herod. King Herod had a rangatiratanga of his area. Pontius Pilate had a, a kawanatanga governorship, but it was a mutual recognition of two powers that came to a common agreement. It's a rough and ready argument. It was used at Waitangi, and what it said was this. Kawanatanga does not invade or dispossess or hassle rangatiratanga Rangatiratanga respects and works as a partner with Kawanatanga. So it was partnership, participation, protection, option, those kinds of things. And this was in Luke's Gospel as a sacred covenantal idea. And in Māori, the chiefs, mission participant chiefs, agreed based on this. They didn't think they were being colonised to the point of invisibility or dispossession. They didn't think they were relinquishing their rangatiratanga. They didn't think they were giving up most of their treasures, land, forestry, fisheries, and so on. They thought that in the trial of Jesus of Nazareth, Pilate, te kawana, refers Jesus to Herod, te rangatira. Pilate doesn't think he can deal with it. So it goes to the rangatiratanga of Herod. Herod is not quite sure he can deal with it and goes back to his partner again in the judicial sense. They thought that it would be a balance. It would be interdependence. It would be a rough and ready sort of win-win. That's why they signed. They didn't think they were going to be colonised to the point of marginalisation or dispossession. And they wouldn't have signed it if they thought that. They were... They were 90% of the population, maybe more. They could have pushed the officials into the sea. But they worked with this kind of covenantal understanding. It's rough and ready. It's not perfect. We live in a fallen world. No political system is completely sinless. There's a bit of ambiguity. But you work with your highest hopes and your best aspirations by praying by referring to the Bible, by keeping your, your um, parable of the sower, your parable of the uh, great feast, your parable of the big-hearted, uh, compassionate one. And it only works if you do that. This will not work. This will not work if you don't have the Bible in the middle of it. If you don't have Te Rongo Paiaruka in the centre, if you don't have the parables of Jesus in your mind, this won't work. It requires trust. It requires reconciliation, it requires big-heartedness, forgiveness, generosity, all the things that had come through those parables. So, that's what it has boiled down today. A sacred covenant of good faith and justice. Now, the reason we had New Zealand land wars is because each one of these promises, their biblical ethic, was broken one way or another. And to get back to the right place for chiefly rule, a fair amount of equity, active participation and protection, real options and active partnership between the partners under God who believed Luke was right and that they could do this together. So essentially, what you have in the Treaty of Waitangi is the antidote, if you will, to decolonization, to decolonization itself. It was an attempt to introduce, if you quickly look at the circle diagram, which you will see on page 14. If you look at the top of the page, what you had with the arrival of the gospel in 1814 was a Maori world which respected a European arrival in very small numbers, bearing a gospel. Then many of those early missionaries were included and protected and partnered within Maori communities. 
Then at Waitangi, they worked out a kind of partnership. Then with the increase in immigration from the Northern Hemisphere, colonization took over and engulfed the Māori world just by sheer statistics, but also by the New Zealand Land Company who broke most of these principles uh, from London without coming here at all. Got the signatures of children, got the wrong chief, invaded, shonky deals, dispossession, and including lots of European people who were given land that didn't exist, which was unfair to them as well. Then the reassertion of Māori uh, self-determination, the second to last diagram, to get back to something like a partnership, which was what was intended in the beginning. On a good day, that means restorative justice. It means mana enhancement both ways. It means a win-win for all the peoples involved, and it can include people of all races. The covenant at Waitangi was a great feast, if you will, to which anyone can respond and enjoy what was on the table. And here is a case of someone who's neither European nor Maori, who is being received and welcomed, uh, a partnership, if you will, between the two people of a totally different race and a totally different culture in this country as the sacred covenant between the two. And lastly, just very quickly looking at what would a decolonized church, a church free of the shackles of imperialism or arrogance or racism or ethnocentrism be engaged in? If it was using a Luke approach, if it was using the treaty as a sacred covenant. Well, you would be into the environment like Psalm 104. Arosha does this, and conservation, getting back to Genesis, working with mana whenua, kaitiakitanga, on restoring creation. You would be into whare for people who don't have them, people who sleep under hedges from the parable of the Great Feast. Salvation Army, um, Christian Community Finance are doing what the government has not been able to do, in enlarging the number of houses available for people who don't have them. You would be into being by the side of the road when somebody's wounded and can't speak for themselves in city missions. You would be honest about abuse when someone has been wounded massively, be accountable, be repentant, be restorative in the Royal Commission. You would do something that's happening in Taranaki through a Bishop's Action Foundation for the common good and for community development, you would support uh, Good Samaritan type projects, which this one is a Christian one, the Order of St. John, a thousand years of living out of the Good Samaritan from Luke in every ambulance you see. And you're sitting in one of them right now. You would actively spend and be spent in a new way of reimagining the partnership from Waitangi where the colonization process has faded into the background and where the high ground of Waitangi has re-emerged in two buildings that look at each other and that have common ground between them. You would find and be found in the Kawanata Tapu or Waitangi, Kikwane. And there it is, just behind us uh, there. The house that binds uh, conflict resolution, peace, justice, education. You would be into no community and participation, the dignity of the human person, every human being, whatever the soil, has a value. You would be into rights and responsibilities, the common good, opting for solidarity with people in poverty, just like the parables. You would be into the dignity and work and rights of workers. You would be into global human solidarity. One whānau under God, one creator, one garden, as the book of Genesis describes it, and you would love what God has given you from millennia, millennia ago before people arrived. I'll just stop there for a moment because that's quite a lot to absorb. What I've tried to give you is an overview of what an Aramaic messiah achieved by his spirit, by his father, in Aotearoa. What happened to that? How 
the message of this Messiah and Luke reasserted itself at Waitangi, how that covenant ground was lost and how it's now reasserting itself. And the examples I've just given are Christian uh, actions of generous sowing of seed, generous hospitality and deep compassion which, from which colonization has evaporated back to person to person, back to the soil of every human being, back to any table, back to any whare, back to any piece of land like this one we're sitting on uh, and let the kingdom come uh, and God's will be done. That's perhaps enough. We'd, let's move to a little bit of Q&A now and see you may want to comment or make make questions as we go. I think, I think you're, you're, you're sitting in one of the examples uh, right here, which is to reshape our lives in treaty partnership terms with mana whenua, to care for creation, there's a garden just up here, to uh, be involved in community gardens, there's a new one at Hawara, I believe, uh, to be actively involved in outreach to the poorest of the poor, to mobilise yourself to people of any condition or sort, uh, to go the extra mile, um, it's, it's not complicated to understand. It's very difficult to do. So those examples I've given you are what a, a church which had decolonized itself is not serving a particular Northern Hemisphere uh, imperial rule. It's just working with Jesus and the seeds he's sown in these islands. And, and just pray, ask for guidance, get together as Christian communities, as you're doing here, to uh, mobilize and, and uh, join join forces in in Waitara or New Plymouth or Stratford, it will all be a little bit different. In Stratford at the moment, for example, it's how does a school uh, survive in a climate like this, which is teaching Jesus and sharing Jesus? Is it financially viable? What would it take to keep that um, gospel place, that gospel message viable? What would it mean to relate to mana whenua for restorative justice, where land is still alienated or where taonga have not been returned? How would you get in behind that? So those are the, those are the, the opportunities. Pat. How do you overcome the vested interest? Yeah. By living the alternative. Um, if, you, if you fight uh, something with its own weapons, you will become like it. But if you live, St. Francis of Assisi, live the alternative uh, and let the alternative speak for itself. The gospel does speak for itself. It did here. All you have to do is open Luke's gospel and let it speak to you um, and live that out as literally and as courageously as you can and see what happens. Yes, it does. But remember, in the end, it comes back to the, the treaty only works from a faith base. It only works from a prayer base. It only works from a parable base. So you, in the end, you make a faith choice about the providence and justice of God. That in the end, you will be vindicated in one way or another. In a fallen world, not going to be perfect. But you will see some signs of the kingdom. The rangatira tanga o tiratua. It will come in some shape or form, little by little, three steps forward, two steps back, but that's one step forward. And you will see, because there is a God, because this is his creation, because this is his um, country. This is not only God's own country, there are other God's own countries. But in the end, it's a faith position. Faith means trust. Yes.
seeing the Good Samaritan actually going out into the community and actually creating ongoing relationships with people. And that's where we actually sow the seed in relationships. Exactly. It, it begins and ends in there with the aroha, with the tanga, with the partnership, with the friendship. Uh, and even one small act can have an enormous effect, a ripple effect. Um, you know, look at the, the, the two prophets, Te Whiti and Tohu. I mean, they started in a Fano circle, then an iwi circle, then it became a, a national witness. Yes. It's a good, beautiful challenge. Um, I would say, knowing human nature as we do, little by little, in the right direction. Let me give a little bit of encouragement. In St. Peter's Cathedral in Kirikiriro in Hamilton, the cathedral choir uh, started learning the Lord's Prayer in Te Reo Māori and singing it in Māori to the uh, Brown Ture tune. You're probably familiar with it. Uh, and it was, it was a bit of, you know, this is a bit new, this is a bit strange, I'm not sure about this. Now, they just close their eyes, mostly, and it goes to a really deep place inside them. And they miss it if they don't have it quite often. They have it in English, they have it in Māori, different times. But if you tried to remove the Lord's Prayer in Māori from St. Peter's Cathedral Choir now, there would be a sense of loss because of the beauty and way to the, the depth of the prayer in Māori. And um, I, I would say little by little. So, for example, a hymn that becomes well-known and becomes so that you can sing it almost with your eyes closed and becomes a way of praying in the end. And Tomangako for Karimaya examples, but we've got to go much further than that. And I think um, it's human nature just like that, little by little. It takes seven times to practice something new normally or to change a habit, not just one or two. And I would say that um, perseverance, uh, just being gentle, being hospitable, giving it a go, uh, uh, I think I've seen enough progress to give me confidence. For example, uh, St Paul's Collegiate. Now, I'll use examples away from here because I know them. St Paul's Collegiate. Anglican School, Hamilton. When I first went there in 1993, I said a blessing in Māori, and a teacher challenged me and said, what language was that? I didn't understand it. Now, they have a school komatua, they have full whaikōrero, they have a Māori language stream, which is very strong, all the way up to the top class. Um, they're visiting Ngāti Wairere, their mana whenua partner. It's got a long way to go, but that's such a contrast and I'll give you another example. In Southall School in Hamilton, these are Anglican schools, um, I went to the headmaster 25 years ago and said, we need a school haka party. And he said, I don't think it would 
I don't think that would work. Now they have three. And ka motawahi at the prize giving. If, if you uh, have a funeral at St. Paul's Collegiate for a young boy, tragically, who's died or a parent, everyone nearly always requests a haka as the hearse. And it just chokes everybody up. It brings out their grief. It, it, it's such a blessing to have this catharsis using tikonga Māori. And these are three-quarter pākaha uh, in number. So these partnership opportunities of a sacred covenant, um, that Lucan, a beautiful Messiah teaching and experience, does eventually commend itself. If you're persistent, you're gracious, you're loving, you're forgiving, never reverse, never back down, but keep on keeping, or keep calm and carry on. I think that may sound a bit trite, but I've seen it work. And I... I Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You you will get there because God is behind it, and um, you know that's your try. Yeah. Question, sir. Yeah. Um, what, in your time as a leader in um, the Anglican Church, what would be a, one of the best examples you've got of church reconciling? Um, but I wonder if you could qualify that with what's the worst example? <laughs> like, because we could learn from, we could learn from both. Well, I, I, that's a very good question because there's one place which has done both, and I can stay with that one example. Um, the worst... Um, Disaster, there may be, actually, there are more than one. I, I'm, think, I'm thinking of Waikato now, just talking, because I, I can't speak for you, and I can't speak from here, but I can speak from being a partner in Waikato. The worst mamai, the worst hurt, the worst tragedy in the Waikato area was the attack on the Anglican Catholic mission village of Rangiofia. Uh, we had a mission there. We were growing, this is 99% Māori, growing fruit and veg, we were feeding Auckland in 1850. Feeding Auckland, fruit and veg business, growing under the mana of Rewi Manga Maniopoto, Ngāti Maniopoto, Ngāti Apukura, Ngāti Henu too. Big, beautiful mission station. Um, There's a few people from Europe living there. It was mostly Māori. And unfortunately, a small group of businessmen in Auckland decided that that was competition for their fruit and veg business in Auckland, to feed Auckland, and they backed Governor Gray in his second term to invade the Waikato. Part of the goal was to take out the orchards in the Anglican Catholic Mission to remove the competition. And they persuaded Governor Gray and General Cameron to take out Rangiofia, basically. They left Auckland with that in mind. I won't go into the details of the battle. You can Google. But they, it was going to be a big battle at Patarangi. They went round the back of it and attacked the defenceless, largely defenceless village of Rangiofia, where there were four churches, um, five or six marae, a race course, a flour mill, and vast gardens. Uh, there were six rifles in the village, and no one was expecting an attack. Bishop Selwyn had been told by Governor Gray and General Cameron that people would be safe in the church. And they were burned alive in a fracas, which no one has completely sorted out. It was just awful. And Jesus, Jesus wept. The Jesus of Luke's parables. What happened to my seed? What happened to my banquet? What happened to my heart on the road? Well, uh, it, it was such a deep loss and pain for generations and generations until Ngā Komatua o Ngāti Apukura, particularly Tom Raw and Bill Harris, uh, who had kept a gospel-centred faith. It's a miracle. But they did. Luke's gospel resonated all the more through the terrible things that happened. They knew that Jesus wasn't a colonial officer. He resisted empire and sought to outlive it and transform it. So they said, 
let's get back together again the way we were in the beginning, which was 1838, partnership with Te Hahi Mihinari CMS and Ngāti Apukurangāti Henetu. Let's quest for an act of atonement, restorative justice and healing. And they approached us and said, let's do Waitangi again. The sacred covenant. We can get back to where we were. We can start again because we believe in, in Jesus and his story and his message. We believe in his resurrection over crucifixion. We can do this. So they did, and they asked us the impossible. They said, this is Rangatiratanga and Kawanatanga partnership, participation, protection, equity options. They said, we want our marae back. Now that's rich, expensive, fertile land. By an Anglican church, which by some miracle has survived from 1853. Still there. Before the battle. Still there. So they said, when the next bit of land comes up on our old pa, on our old marae, we want you to hold hands with us and get it back, which is really expensive. Uh, we went into an auction where we couldn't compete. We were outbidded by people with more resources than we had. But we trusted in the God of the parables. We trusted in Luke's message. We trusted in the great feast, the seed sower and the good Samaritan. And they asked me to go and talk to them. And by some miracle, these people let us buy the land. The church didn't have the money. Uh, it's like, you know, have another hymn, send the plate round twice. And um, you know that old fundraising joke from a preacher? Brothers and sisters, we have the money we need for our new project. That's the good news. The bad news is it's still in your pockets. Anyway, that's enough. But we, we used, um, and there's a couple of people in this room who were crucial to this, uh, whom I will always respect to the end of my days, on trust boards and other unlikely places. With two weeks' notice, we cobbled together the money to buy it from the higher bidder, who then changed their minds and let us. And so we're giving it back to Apakura on November the 5th. And they are putting their marae, their parekai, their papakainga, their kaumatua housing on their ancestral land. And then they got us. This is again Kawanatanga, Rangatiratanga partnership covenant. They said, and now we need to go together to the crown and get more uh, land to get back the fruit and veg orchards that were lost and burned and trashed. So we went to three ministers of the crown together and they agreed in principle. And when they were asked, we're working on this now, when they were asked, uh, oh, well, surely Ngāti Maniapoto have settled with the crown or are settling with the crown, uh, we said, um, yes, but, Pari, but, but Rangiofia is such a deep uh, tragedy, can't you see it as a case on its own, apart from the big tribal land claim? And they said, yes, we can because of Parihaka. This is Nanaya Mahuta, Andrew Little, and Kelvin Davis. So we're working with them now to enlarge the footprint uh, to get the fruit and veg business, orchards, pear, peaches, um, back the way it was in 1838. And you know what? We didn't do it for this reason, but the church is full. It's not the reason we did it. But they pray there regularly now. Yes. Kia ora. Yeah. Yes. It's, it, that's why I think it does come down to trust in God in the end, because if you look at that tragedy, you would think, can anything heal that? Is there, is there a God or not? That's a faith position. Uh, and 
it's what it does come down to, I think. Anything else before we 